So I'm here with Vinny Todd Tolman, who is a near-death experience survivor. He is the author of The Light After Death, My Journey to Heaven and Back. His story is absolutely incredible, and I'm so grateful to welcome Vinny to the, to the program today. Uh, how are you doing today? Doing awesome today. How are you doing today, Timothy? Good, good. Yeah, thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. You have lived an experience that most people have not. At least you've come back to to talk about it, and your story is is fantastic. But so you died. You literally died for nearly an hour. You were put into a body bag, and your consciousness lived on. and And your story is really interesting. But what what happened? Well, essentially, I took a new supplement that was new to the market at the time and was very popular. So we took an an overseas version, which uh, was not the same version as what we were getting in the States and turned out to be 20 times more potent or or 20 times stronger than than the American stuff. So me and a buddy of mine, we both got sick off of it. We went down to a, a fast food joint thinking, you know, maybe get a bite to eat if you feel better. And there I went in the bathroom and I ended up dying. I ended up aspirating right there. My buddy, he vomited and they called 911, hauled him away and he was fine. He got out of the hospital the next day after they pumped his stomach, did some charcoal treatments, that kind of stuff. Um, But for me, um, I wasn't so lucky. I went in the bathroom and locked the door and I passed out and aspirated. And from there I watched everything play out in front of me. I didn't know at the time that it was my own death that I was watching because it, it's very surreal to have an experience like this because uh, I was not there. I was above there and I was watching there, but but me was not there. So to me, it didn't dawn on me for a while until they actually revived the body. I didn't know it was my own death that I had just watched. So it was, it was really remarkable and life-changing because it, it helps us understand that the consciousness is much larger than we could ever understand. It really is. Um, the consciousness goes eternal, uh, essentially, and, and we tend to think very temporally with the consciousness, especially even in psychology and, and in medicine. But no, the, the consciousness is eternal. The, this, whether you want to call it consciousness, soul, spirit, it's the same thing. It goes forever. And um, it was really very profound, the experience I had. I Even after they revived the body, I was put in a hospital brain dead for three days. And during those three days, I was over playing on, on the real side of existence, the, whereas this is not the real side of existence. That's the real side. And, and so I got to experience what our life was like before here and what our life is like after here and um and really kind of peek behind the curtain and 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 see why we're here and and what we're doing here and and that things aren't so dramatic as we try to play them out here because we're we're eternal beings and you know 80 to 100 years is which is about the longest you could live here uh, is not that much time compared to eternity. So, um, yeah, it was really amazing. It was absolutely amazing to have the whole experience. So when you were out of your body, you sensed that you were part of something greater and this was happening. What what exactly did you see and and sense when you were out? The first thing that I remember is is that as the, the room was spinning on me as I went to pass out, the next thing I felt was this cold plunge and it was like a plunge into electricity. That's what it felt like. That's the best way I can describe it, even though that doesn't really describe it for anybody who, uh, but it, it gives a visualization of what that's like. It felt like I was plunged into this high energy, uh, this cool energy, this refreshing energy. And um, as I was plunged into this, I just felt presence all around me and, and within me too, which was weird, but it was a, an, another presence not my own, and and a grander presence, a presence that is in everything in the universe. And um, as I was feeling this and, and watching everything play out, my emotions were just up and down, up and down, because I was sitting there watching this, this drama unfold in front of me as they were trying to revive this body and, and uh, bring it back. And, and they ended up bringing the heart back and bringing most of the body back, just not the brain. 
And as this is all going forward, I experienced a, a presence behind me. And as I did, I turned around to see who it was. And I recognized that it wasn't necessarily the same presence as what I was feeling in everything, but it was likely, it was like that presence. And I turned around and saw this, this white gentleman uh, with a long white beard, long white hair, but very, very pink skin. He didn't look very old, which was, which was kind of odd to me. He looked like maybe in his 30s or 40s, but yet he had like the long white hair and long beard. But his skin, his pink skin, it glistened like with light and light was coming out of him. Like it came from him. And I felt just this unconditional love from this guy, just absolute unconditional love. And my first instinct, uh, being raised traditional evangelical Christian, um, I, I asked, oh, you must be God. And, uh, and without him even moving his mouth, I heard his voice kind of chuckle a little bit and say, no, son, I'm not God. And, and then I realized that I was also having just thoughts and he was hearing my thoughts. And the next thought I had was, well, then you must be Jesus even though he didn't look like Jesus. <laughs> and and uh, he, he just laughed at that. He's like, no, son, I'm not Jesus either. And, and I'm like, well, who are you? And he says, well, I'm your guide. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help escort you back to your body, or I can help escort you to see what's next. And so I, I opted. And he, he also let me know his name. He said his name is Drake. And um, I opted to go with him. I didn't want to go back towards that hell that I was watching below me, that, that pain and that struggle of trying to bring that body back. It looked like hell. To me, uh, I wanted to go with him towards that energy that he was just pouring on me continually. So, yeah, so I went, went with him, and it was um, quite a journey. It was a, essentially mostly of three days to get there. We is probably about our time, about two days worth of time of journeying to get there, and then about one day's worth of time that we were actually there in heaven and uh, and experiencing things. But right off the bat, though, he let me understand that the journey from here, from the physical realm to the eternal home, our eternal home, it's it's not just a journey of distance; it's a journey of consciousness and a journey of understanding. And he. He equated that to frequency, and then I had to raise my understanding or raise my frequency to be able to get there. I couldn't just go there, otherwise my energy, it, it wouldn't match, and so I wouldn't be able to get in to that space until my energy can match. So he was there to, to help me with that process of, of getting me along the way and, and raising my frequency and helping me kind of... Uh, Get a, get a good grasp for what's going on in our real existence versus what, we, what we're taught here in our different religions, you know? That's, that's very interesting. And I understand that you also witnessed some of what was happening with, with the paramedics, which I want to get to in a minute. But with being in this heaven, what was that like? And, and what did you sense there? Oh, what, did, what did you see there? Like to, I wish so bad I could bring a blade of grass from heaven and bring it here. I wish so bad because if we could, if we could just put that in the Smithsonian, it would change the world. Like, like if somehow we could take that, that small piece of heaven and bring it here. But in essence, that's what, that's what the creator did by putting all of us here is we're all little slivers of that space, every single one of us. And, um, but to be there, to experience that, it's just, I mean, just this, the, the absolute pristine, beautiful ambiance, feeling, smell, taste of just the experience alone of just grass. That's just grass there, let alone everything else um, is just fundamentally life changing to who you are as a being. It is because the everything there is made of so much love. And love and light is the same thing there. Um, so everything's full of light. And, and it's weird. The way we experience a color and light here, we experience it with an, an external light reflecting color onto something. And that's how we, we, that's how we discern color with our eyes. There, the light comes from within. So everything there has a glow or a light. 
And that's why colors are very different there. And that's why there's so many different colors there that we don't have here is because we're a refractory light space or a, in the third dimension, whereas they're, they're a source light uh, space. So everything, ha that everything there is the source of light. Um, so there's not like this big external sun like we have. It's like the, like the heaven space itself is a sun. And we live on it, but it's not burning. It's not. It's not like a our sun. Yeah. Did you see other people that you recognized from this plane and in Earth? And if so, what was that like? I didn't see people that I recognized necessarily, but I I recognized different cultures that I was seeing. I I could definitely easily discern that there was people in that space from our past, our present, and our future which was really hard for me to comprehend how someone from our earthly future was already in heaven. And, and the way that it was described to me is there's no such thing as time, that time is an illusion just for us here. From their side of things, the real side of things, they can slip in and out wherever they need to. Um, because again, it's a construct just for down here, for the third dimension, for earth life, for our solar system, our galaxy. Um, but yeah, time doesn't exist. There's no such thing. And that's how it's relative, too. It's relative to here and only here. And that's also why, you know, when you go into physics and you start taking objects away from here, away from our gravity, time doesn't follow. Um, time is just for here. It's really, it's an amazing thing. It's a beautiful thing. But it's part of the cage of the third dimension. Yeah. But I got mm. to see lots of different, lots of different people and... Um, saw them in this like school type structure that was made out of a single per piece of marble, this entire structure. And it was just absolutely gorgeous. It, the, the building itself had a presence. And for someone to go in and out of a room, they had to actually match the energy of the room. And then the room would just create an opening. They would go in and then it would just seal itself off. Not with a door, though. It just like open. And people go in and just seal itself off, almost like liquid. Yeah, everything there is just is built out of out of such tremendous amount of energy and love, which is so weird because here we feel we have so much lack of that. Um, but yet, if you if you go to the the pristine moments of your life, that's where you're feeling that love. And that's that's part of our journey here is to have those moments and have have that connection with our creator to experience those little little slivers of love so that when we get back there, we recognize it. You know, that's that's incredible. When you saw these other beings, how did they appear to you in, in this state of mind? How did you how did they appear? So the so I saw them from a distance. They weren't close up, but I got to see quite a few different cultures and different, you could definitely discern different religions by how people dressed. So I did see many religions there. There was, it's not like uh, a lot of our religions teach there's only one religion in heaven, but nope. Um, there's a lot of, in fact, I would, I would be pressed to say there's all religions in heaven. It seems like the cream of the crop of all the religions is there. So the best people from all the religions are there. Um, the ones who really embodied divine love and divine service and, and divine creation, creating relationships and caring about others. They were the masters of that space. They were like the ones who could go anywhere they wanted to. And the, for, for the rest of us that we hadn't mastered that kind of stuff for all of us, regular people, we could go to certain places in, in that space, but not everywhere. If you wanted to go everywhere, you had to really master the ability of, to love, which is, it's kind of like your your past card, your energetic card that allows you to go anywhere in that space. Did did your beliefs change when you after this happened? What did you think before versus what did you think after? Did did your well, perception change? Absolutely. Yeah, completely changed me around. Completely got me way back on track. Um, you know, even though I was raised evangelical Christian, I, you know, in my church we we had believed that there was this single, single little tiny path that you had to go to get to heaven and everybody else was thrown away and like literally thrown away as a soul. And it's, it's so opposite of what is reality. Yes, there is that single little path 
that gets you to the front of the class or gets you up there to wherever you want to go. So yeah, if you follow that singularity path, it does give you the most mobility there. But there's there's people that are following that singular path, judging others. And you can't get to heaven when you're judging others because whatever judgment you put on others, you get three times that judgment from yourself. So you don't allow yourself to get there, which is weird. There's no there's no judge and jury there. All it is 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 life here is an absolute classroom and not a courtroom. We're we're here to learn. We're here to grow. We're here to foster relationships, build relationships, learn how to love and create, and then we get to go and and take what we learned here and use it there. That's what it's all about. That's what this whole experience here is about. And we dramatize it. We say, you know, this religion is not going to get there. This religion is not going to get there. And it's 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 completely wrong. I believed everything being you know raised in the, in the faith. And, and coming back, I'm still Christian, but I'll tell you, um, I'm a very, very different version, a very all-encompassing, all-loving. I love all religions. I love all belief systems. I love all lifestyles. I love, I love all people. I love all life forms. Um, I love all animals. I just, uh, I love everything that, that our creator has created here. And if we could really grasp how important it is for us to love everything, we could we could fundamentally change our existence here and this whole world is changing whether we like it or not um, us as humans our our time here on this planet is is based upon us being able to evolve with the planet and change with the planet and raise our frequency and and those who can't raise their frequency they won't last on this planet um, and it's important for us to to really embody and master the the power of love and and relationships caring about each other and taking care of each other and when we do that we're raising that frequency with the planet for people that won't last on this planet or that won't last i mean what 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 do you mean so so essentially if you if you take something of of low density and and put it near something of a very high frequency that is emitting a a broadcast frequency as you pray, take that that low density item it'll eventually just shatter as it gets closer and it's it's like the two don't match so the the earth has been on a long trajectory for this from eons ago that that every so often the earth itself has a a jump in in frequency some people call it evolution but you can actually study this too on the earth and as the earth goes through these cycles, these big cycles of jumps, we're, we're well into one of these jumps. And if we don't raise our understanding and start taking better care of each other, start taking better care of our planet, take better care of our animals, um, then we, you know, it's, it's only those who raise that frequency, get to that higher love frequency and stay there, that will end up staying on the planet. And I, and I don't mean like there's going to be like waves of stuff hitting the planet, taking those low density items off, people off. But what it is, is, is the lower frequency beings, they'll have, you know, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, all sorts of natural diseases will take them out naturally in a loving way, obviously, in, in um, the way that life does. But that's how it's going to happen. There's going to be masses of this happening in the, in the future. Masses, huge masses. So if people have different frequencies, when they pass away, where do the lower frequencies go? So the good side of things is all of us are literally in hell right now, here. This is as bad as it gets. It only gets better from here. So even if we're a, a real piece of work, we do mistake after mistake, we abuse people, we, let's say we're like a Hitler type being, it still gets better from here even for the worst of us. So that means if we're just even average, it gets amazing. And if we're above average, it gets extremely amazing. And if we really live that, that singularity path of doing, doing all that we can for good, um, it gets ex like extremely, extremely amazing. So um, the good news is it's just the, the whole system is built out of love. So to even exit this system, this third dimension, it's just so amazing. It's, it's so amazing. There, it's, it's hard to put words around it because it's not something that words can describe. 
but just the feeling of love when you first get on that side of things, no matter what you've ever done in this life, that love is for you. And that's part of the grace of the creator. Um, and, you know, different religions have explanations of that. And that, that grace is so all encompassing. And I, I, for one can testify of that because I was one of those kind of jackasses when I was 25 and this happened to me, I was, I was living the, I call it the ego path. I was, all I was about was my entertainment, my weekend entertainment, my evening entertainment and how much I was making and what I was driving. That was, that was pretty much my happiness level back then. And I was doing bodybuilding at the same time. And I thought that was part of who I was as far as happiness. And after this experience, it, it did completely change me, completely change me. I don't care what I drive. Don't care what the income is. I don't care about all these other things that I used to care so much about. Now, are those things still pertinent here? Yes, they're pertinent, but they're not priorities for me. What's priorities for me is my family, the people I care about around me, the the animals, the 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 beings, the creatures around me. I want to foster an, an amazing relationship of love with anyone I can around me. This is so beautiful, and I have so many questions, more questions here than we're going to have time for, but. Uh, a couple things that I definitely want to get to. One is you witnessed the paramedics from outside of your body. It was very, very interesting. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you saw these three paramedics and two of them were older, one was younger, and they literally zipped you in a in a body bag. So what happened with, with that? So what, yeah, what had happened is they called 911, they called emergency services, they got an ambulance there, so a medical team. The medical team had two veterans and then had a, a training rookie. They came, they they saw the body, they pronounced it dead. They did try to do some preliminary resuscitation to it, um, but but it didn't take, it didn't work. The body was already cold. So they went ahead and put it in a body bag. They, you know, strapped it down to the to the the gurney like you would a dead body, not a living person, because there was a tight strap around the neck that you would never put on. A living person and um yeah it was it was very odd for me to witness and it almost felt like a movie to me because the the body didn't look real at that point the neck had gotten really wide it had gotten wider than the jaw and the face of the the body was very purple and yellow and when i say purple i mean like lavender and yellow like bright yellow bright lavender it didn't look like human and um I felt like it was very, very much almost like a Hollywood job, you know, looking at this dead body. They put it in the body bag. I still didn't know it was me, though, because me was up here watching everything. And as I'm watching them put in the in the ambulance, I can hear the the thoughts of everybody. So I could hear the thoughts of the medics, the, the manager of the restaurant. I could hear the thoughts of literally everyone. And as I'm hearing their thoughts, I could hear the thoughts of the rookie. And the rookie is like going off on himself. Like, why didn't you uh, speak up? Why don't you try harder for this one? Why are you even training um, to do this job if you can't make a difference for this guy? And he kept thinking and feeling like kind of like this heartache that he didn't get to try his hardest to make this guy come back. And he felt he felt that the two medics, the veteran medics, kind of gave up too quick. Even though his training told him that, he, he felt that he wanted to try further, but he he didn't speak up. He was brand new. This is literally his first week on the job. And so they pull away from the scene uh, with that dead body. He's in the back seat staring at the, the body inside the bag and still having these thoughts. And out of nowhere, I feel this force, like real force go over me and from where I'm watching. And I see it hit him. And all of a sudden, this light starts to form and, and starts to glow almost like there was a little sun inside of his shirt in, in the heart space. That's where it was glowing. And um, as that, that started to happen, I heard very loudly, this one's not dead. And I knew he heard it too, because as soon as it was said, he, he quickly like looked around and he, he was trying to figure out, hey, what, what was that? And um, as he did that, he, he kind of shrugged it off and thought that must have been my imagination. And about a half block down the road, it happened again for a second time, but the light got even brighter. It went from about his, his hips to above his head. And 
Then he, uh, for a second time, very loudly, this one's not dead. And on that second time, that was enough for him. He decided he was going to uh, attempt resuscitation. So he, he quietly unzipped the body bag, undid some straps so he could get his hand inside the body bag. He started feeling around the, the jaw and the neck area for a pulse, couldn't feel anything. Went inside the arm, couldn't feel anything. He unzipped the bag further and went down to the thigh of the leg. As he was doing that, he pressed. And he pressed so hard that he made it kind of push through the muscle tissue and made contact with the femur bone. And as he made contact with that femur bone, um, I felt an ignition or a spark from where I was and where he was. And, and I, he jumped a little bit, so did I, but we both realized it. And, and instantaneously, he started to attempt resuscitation, like full-on attempt, meaning he, he went and, and hooked up a, a defibrillator and started uh, shocking the body to try to bring the heart back. He force-fed um, air into the lungs and, and started doing what his training did. But as, um, as they get to this, the second round of shocks, they, got, they did get one heartbeat. And then the third round of shocks, he got a steady, steady but faint heartbeat. But it was steady and, and strong, but just a faint strong. It was like consistent, yeah. And then the body was alive at that point. It, it still, it, you know, it still wasn't out of the woods. They had to do a lot of injections and all sorts of like thinners in the blood and all sorts of stuff to get the body to fully come back. The body was uh, going through seizures uh, complete convulsions like all over the place as they were trying to bring it back um, at the hospital. So the, one of the miracles of this, though, to me, the, the, one of the most beautiful things is this rookie who listened to that voice, listened to that light that was, was trying to penetrate his heart. The second miracle to me is the fact that when the heart started, they were a half of a block from a hospital. So, uh, you know, they weren't planning on turning the body into a hospital. They were turning the body into a medical examiner. And um, so the, the, the way, the route that they were driving, when the heart started, it just so happened, it was a half of a block from a hospital. So by the time they got to that hospital, there was already a team there ready to meet the body. So it was, it was awesome. They were able to, to do the, the professional medicine stuff that they do to try to help revive or bring somebody back. Wow. So where, where was the voice that he heard that said, this one is not dead? Was that coming from you or, or how did... No. So it's weird. It, it came from both of us. So it came from everything around me. It, it's almost like if you're in a movie theater and you hear all the speakers say the same sentence all around the room, that's what it felt like. It felt like it came from everywhere. But I, I know he heard it, and I know I heard it, because I heard it very loudly. And, and the way he jumped the first time, I knew he heard it. Yeah. That's incredible. And did you, did you get the sense that people communicate that way telepathically? Yes, we do. And, and it's funny, um, I've since, I've since uh, you know, since I've come back, I've actually seen it quite a bit in our world. We see it all the time with um, sometimes police partners, they'll, they'll do things for each other without saying any words. Um, you know, partners in life, sometimes you'll see them, spouses, you'll see them um, do things for each other without saying any words. And they have this nonverbal communication that when, when they get in this love sink where they care a lot for each other, they, they care to protect each other a lot, um, you see a lot of this where where this nonverbal communication just happens without using words. And, and really, that's our real language. That's our original language. Language of speaking through the tongue and the mouth, that's just for here, just for here, just for the third dimension. And in fact, um, that was one thing I noticed right away when I came into contact with spirits or angels on the heaven side of things. If they didn't have a sexuality at all, like you couldn't, you could say, they're beautifully beautiful and handsome, and you'd have to say yes to both. You could tell that they had not been to earth yet. Um, and having a sexuality at all, having a, um, an orientation to either sex um, or not, is, is kind of based here and only here. Whereas those that don't have, like, you know, they don't have that at all. It's, it's, it's those who have never been here that are that way. Yeah. Would you say that now that you are back here after this experience, did it make you more intuitive or more tapped into, into your intuition and that sort of thing? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I, I work, work with my team daily. We all have team spirit teams that work for us and, um, it's up to us. Um, they're there for us anytime when we want help. Um, you know, the, the old scripture says to, if, to open that door, you have to knock first. So you have to go and knock on their door and they, they will open up and, and help us. And, um, yeah, definitely. I, I'm more intuitive. I, I know things, experience things. Um, I have a, a very strong discernment is what I like to call it, where I can just know beyond what people are saying or doing. I know what's really going on. And um, like behind closed doors, even I can know what's going on. I just have a very strong discernment. And I'm going to call it spirit based because it's spirit that helps me have that. And I've had it ever since I got back. I've just, it's taken a long time to master it and, and understand the communication because they're not using words and we do use words here. So it's, it's uh, a little, little hard to, to get the right understanding and, and lingo, how they speak in spirit. But, um, after time it's, but I'm coming up on my 20 year anniversary on January 18th. So, um, it's, it's, I've had some time to, to master it and I've gotten really good at it now. And that, that's not something that happened prior, at least not to this extent prior. No, to I did. I, I did have a, a, a bit of something called, uh, being an empath before. Um, but that was more of a survival mechanism. I was raised in kind of an abusive home and I needed to know, um, what my abuser was feeling and how my abuser was feeling before they entered the house, before they entered the room. And so I, it, it kind of forced me to open up to the perception of people's emotions and be able to feel them, even having them near me, I could feel their emotions. And so I had that. I didn't know what that was. Um, but I'm, I'm actually really glad I had that because when I, ha- I was already having my experience on the other side with that already programmed into me, it made me very aware of everything going on around me and I knew not to, to let myself get distracted by the brightness and, and, and the little things. I wanted to notice everything. So um, it was really, it was a blessing in disguise to be raised in abused home because uh, it did, it allowed me to be totally aware of everything that was going on around me through the whole experience and perceive probably a lot more than what most people would perceive. Your perspective changed after, after your death. Absolutely. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, and now I'm very grateful for my past. Whereas I used to run from my past, try to drink from, you know, drink my past to drown it um, uh, in, in, in alcohol and drugs. And, and it was not a good thing. And, uh, you know, coming back, I, I bless my past. I, I'm grateful for it. It's, it's like the, the grinding of the sword. It made me sharper and better for for what I experienced and what I have in my own future. So I am grateful for it, absolutely. And what do you think the purpose of life is if you are alive before you come here and after you leave here, then what is the purpose of life? Is there is there a purpose that you... There is. So the, the purpose is for us to make decisions. And when we don't make the decisions, we're wasting opportunities to grow. Um, and to give you a little explanation, before we came here, we were all up with the Creator, and we just synchronized everything the Creator wanted. We wanted because that that love force is so strong there. We it was very hard for us to have a a dissenting thought or a separate thought from the Creator. We wanted to just be yes men, you know. We wanted to just comply with whatever the creator wanted. And, and just like if a kid stays at home too long, they, they're only going to grow so much. They're, they're going to grow a lot once they leave home. And we realized that, our creator realized that, that we wanted to grow by leaving home. So uh, in a special way, the creator uh, made a system where we could lend a piece of our consciousness down into this little dark hole called Earth, and have these mortal experiences and learn how to make decisions. And what decisions do for us is they're kind of like working out um, muscles in the gym. They're allowing us to um, use our energy 
and create things. And, and people think they're not creators. They are. If you make decisions, you're creating. And, and what's funny is if you don't make decisions, you're creating. You're allowing others to create in you. So um, it's, it's really, it begins with our thoughts. Then those thoughts become our actions. And then our actions become our character. And our character becomes our destiny. And our destiny directs us where we go in this life. And then it, it also tends to direct us where we go next. Um, but it's not like this, you know, win, lose, or draw type situation. We all win by being here. Literally, we all won already. Just to get here, we won. And we had to be the elect just to even get here and have this opportunity to grow and to, to learn in the classroom of life. And um, once we get here, even if we hardly learn anything, it's still a good thing. If we learn a lot, it's an awesome thing. And if we learn a heck of a lot, it's an amazing thing. And the creator celebrates with us all along the way. Our wins, our losses, our, our failures, um, this self-sabotage and this self-judgment that is all, like permeating this world is so wrong. It is so opposite of the creator. The creator is our cheerleader and the one who loves us the most. And, and it's so funny because so many religions try to teach us that the creator saves a tiny little stream of people and throws away the rest. But yet at the same time, we also believe that the creator is a better lover of, of humanity than we are. And if that's the case, just fundamentally, if that's the case, how is it that us, when we have our families, we know we would never throw away our kids, not one of them. We would do everything within our power at least I would, I would do everything within my power and my resources to take care of and love my children, no matter what decisions they make. And that's the love of a human being. And what's amazing is the love of the creator is, is zillions more than what I can experience as a human being here. And that shows you the love of the universe, that that, that love permeates everything here and there's nothing lost here. There's nothing lost here. So even when we feel lost, we're not. We need to dive deep inside ourselves, find God, and start communicating. Go into the holiest temple on earth, and it's right here. It's between these two temples. That's the holiest space on earth. Hmm, the, the third eye, so to speak. I mean, right? Yeah, the third eye, the mind, yeah. The mind, I see. Are we all connected? Are we all part of, part of we're all, this, or we're is all it part a separate? Are we all separate? We're, we're, all, we're all one. But we're not all one being in, in the fact that we're not one consciousness. We're, we're all separate consciousnesses, all of us. In fact, in some of us, we have multiple consciousnesses like competing and, and working. But I'll, what's amazing about it, though, is we're all on one team. We're on God's team. We're on the Creator's team. And the Creator uh, has a, a string, a silver cord attached to all of us, in essence. And... And people call it their higher self, their soul, their spirit. That's what that cord is. And that's how we're allowed to come down here and experience things. It allows our consciousness here. Even though our real, our real presence is up there, our consciousness is, is kind of downloaded down here for us to experience things. Um, and, and our real being is, is vastly larger than our experience here. Just vastly larger. And... And yeah, so it, there is this this oneness between all of us where uh, the funny thing is when someone hurts someone else, I always equate it to being fingers on the hand. When someone hurts, you know, this finger hurts this finger, it's still unified by the body of the hand and the hand would be the creator. All of us individuals would be the fingers. Um, mm. And and that's what that's really what it is, is we're all part of the creator. We're all part of the 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 creator family. And for us to hurt another is to hurt our brother or sister and to hurt ourselves. And, um, yeah, it's, they, they taught me this thing called the, the principle of the pointed finger when I was over there hmm. where we sometimes will go like this and we say that person's so bad. P pointing what we're our doing, finger. Pointing our finger. Yeah, we're pointing our finger. Yeah. We're pointing one, one point of energy towards that person at the same time. And we're putting one point of energy towards the creator and then flip that hand over, and we're putting three points of energy back at our own heart. So anything we're saying outwardly, negatively, actually is impacting us three times stronger negatively in our own heart. So 
using that principle, using that functionality of the system, we can also do good things. We can complement. So if we're pointing a compliment out, we're comp- you know, sending that compliment out. It's going out to that person, going to God, and three times more uh, light is coming back to us. So it's really important for us to choose, choose the light, choose the, the higher frequency, the love frequency, and, and um, make our choices leaning towards that, that love frequency everywhere that we can. And as we do, it, it compounds. It gets stronger and stronger and stronger for us. And it ends up elevating us to a whole new level here, let alone there. There, it's a whole nother level, yeah. That's, that's really, really fascinating. Many people watching this are, are like myself. They're very interested in this and you know, are, believe or at least are open-minded to this type of thing. But for anyone that is skeptical out there that just has a hard time believing in, in the notion of life after death, what, what would you... What would you say to them? Here's the thing. Even if someone's skeptical about life after death, um, it doesn't change the fact that, I mean, there's plenty of atheists in heaven. Um, It's just they tend to have been the atheists that treated each other very respectful and loving. And so that, that is paramount above all. And whether we believe it or not, it is the system. And at one point we'll, we'll end up giving in and saying, okay, I'll, I want to progress, so I I have to admit that there is life afterwards. But everything is free agency, everything. So even if we don't want to believe that there's afterlife, we can, our soul, our spirit, our essence, our energy can stay here. But to anybody, anybody who says that they um, are scientifically minded and they say they don't believe in an afterlife, I say, go look at physics because the principle of energy the principle of energy is energy can is only converted from form to form to form, and it never ends. It never ends. So that's the same essence of who we are. And they and and by modern science, they've actually now got the atomic weight of a soul. By the way, they can weigh the the body itself weighs differently after the soul leaves than it did moments earlier before the soul left. And there's um, some really neat quantum science about thought and string theory and about the power of creation. And, and if we can think it, we can create it. Thus it is. And, and just following that rabbit hole, if you want to call it that, it's going to take you in a really cool place where you realize that, you know, it, it's actually ignorant to, to ignore all of this, these, this physics, and say I choose to accept all of this, but not that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. That you know, to what level you want to call it a creator is is up to you. Where you feel comfortable. Some people they don't like using the word God. Some people don't like using um, other deity names. Um, but it doesn't matter. God, you know, the the creator doesn't care what name you call them. It's, what they do care is that you reach out or you reach in. Because the creator you're going to connect to the best is inside of you. That's where you're going to find the best connection. And, um, and that's where you're going to find your light is inside you, not outside you. And, and for anyone watching this, that whether they have a, a terminal illness or whether they are just terrified of the notion of, of dying, what, what would you say to them? Even if you have a disease, you don't have to be at dis-ease like bring easeness into your soul, e- easeness into your heart that there is a loving team ready to meet you the second that you're crossing. And for, for most people, that's full of loved ones. For most people, if you don't have loved ones in your life here, don't even worry about that. There's still a team. Um, number one, you're never, ever, ever alone here. Ever. Even when you feel the most alone, you're not alone. There's teams around you. They want to be loving you, helping you, assisting you in everything. Um, and that's why we're alive, let alone when we cross. When we cross, it's just absolutely peaceful, profoundly full of unconditional love. No matter what kind of self-judgment or self-belief you have or religion or, or lack of religion, that love is just all permeating. It rushes through you and it, and it 
washes away all the dark spots, all the all the the hustles that that life is programmed into you, and um, and the hardships and the traumas that we've allowed to be programmed in us. It washes those things away, and it allows you to just fully move forward. The one caution I have for people is don't allow yourself to die or or be dying or living in victimhood because victimhood is a cage. It's a cage created in our brain. Hmm. It's a cage created in our mind. And that's the only thing that I saw there that prevented people from getting to heaven was victimhood. And whether it's self-created or, or worldly created doesn't matter. Don't allow yourself to be the victim because victimhood is like poison, drinking poison and hoping hoping whoever harmed you gets ill. And and that's never going to happen. You can drink that poison of victimhood all day long, and it's never, ever going to hurt the other person, uh, whoever harmed you. So you've got to let that go. Let the victimhood go. And it's not about the person who harmed you. The releasing of victimhood or forgiveness, I'm going to call it forgiveness, allowing forgiveness is all about you and nothing about them. It's all about you. It's because you want to get out of the cage. You don't want to be the canary in the cage that prevents yourself from going and seeing the trees and the flowers and life. Go experience life outside the cage. The cage itself is is what prevents souls from getting into heaven. In fact, as we approached heaven, it was surrounded by this mist. And as we got closer and closer, I realized this mist was comprised of all these big orbs and I realized that was the pearly gate. That was the gate of pearls that prevents people from getting into heaven. And I asked my guide, Drake, what's going on there? What is this? And he showed me inside this gentleman from about like the late 1800s, early 1900s, Italian gentleman, immigrant to in the United States. He was cussing out his son in his own mind's eye. He was sitting there cussing him out in Italian. And I could understand everything he was saying towards his son. And, and so he had been there in time-wise for close to 100 years by the time I got there. And he finally was getting to the end of his, his energy where he had gotten the, the last bit of victimness out of him in saying what he needed to say to his son. Then all of a sudden he realized that he wasn't even speaking to his son. He looked around, realized he was surrounded by light. And then instantaneously, all these angels came and surrounded him, and they ushered him into heaven. And, and so it was a very beautiful experience by one, mean, by one means, but at the same sense, it was also kind of sad that he wasted so much of our time trying to expel this victimhood that he had experienced. He had been betrayed by his son, so he's very upset about this, and, and somehow he felt it led to his death. So he was... He was just so, so upset about it. He couldn't let it go. But he finally was able to get to the end of everything he had to say. But he was going for like almost 100 years. So don't waste your time. Don't waste your time in the cage. You don't need to be in the pearly gate. You don't need to be in there. You, you can release that now so that when, whether, and here's the funny thing is, I recommend people release their, their, their victimhood and forgive everybody who has harmed you for you and do it now no matter what your health is no matter when you're going to die because we don't know when we're going to die none of us do you look at the the recent incidents in the nfl like we just don't know the day the circumstance of what could happen to us so we we've really got to be cognizant of of escaping the cage of victimhood and and that's for us not for anyone else for us forgive people for you not for them it's even though you're forgiving them forgive them for you because it frees you it's absolutely freeing so if there is no time and time is different there than here would you say that there are no are there accidents i guess that's what i'm getting at if you when you pass away when you passed away in the bathroom was that going to happen before it did i mean was that so ine- it's inevitable <laughs> It's like I get this question quite a bit from my friends, not from interviews, but from my friends. They they ask, well, if because I tell them it was destiny for me to die, it was destiny for me to make my mistakes. I call it divine synchronicity. Um, and at the same time, they're like, well, what if you didn't make that mistake? I'm like, 
Well, God knew me. God knew I was going to make that, that mistake. You know, my creator knew where my weaknesses were and kind of programmed them. So the, the, the answer to that question is uh, there is no mistakes. There's no mistakes. Everything happens with purpose and reason. It's just really hard for us to understand the purpose or the reason, especially while the thing is happening or even right after the thing is happening. Sometimes with a, a decade or two of digesting it and processing it, we start to understand why something happened to us. But um, we can take earnest peace in understanding that there's only divine synchronicities and no such thing as accidents. And the visualization I like to give to people is there's a fabric of life. And this fabric of life has all of us woven in and out of it in and out, all these different threads, all different uh, directions, and the different intercrossings, even though it seems happenstance, it seems like we had free agency all the way along the way to go in and out of our weaving. The divine synchronicities were pre-programmed and pre-planned um, by our own accord and by the creator. So we volunteered as well as the creator allowed. Um, and that's the only way that something can happen is if the creator allows it, um, even the worst horrible things that can happen um, are allowed because that agency is so important. But more important than the agency is the recoil factor. So whenever there's something very, very wrong done, typically there's something very good on the opposite end happening in this earth space, in this world space. So sometimes when we have the most atrocious things happening on earth, we also have some of the greatest things happening on earth. Um, so it's, it's important for us to to find that silver lining on everything, even if it means we stop looking over here where the, the victimhood is, and we look over here where the victoriousness is. And, and that's what we have to do. We have to tilt our, our persona and tilt our, our paradigm and, and tilt it towards uh, victoriousness and become victorious in your life and, and stop being a victim. That's that's very interesting, and we are running kind of short on time, but I do have a couple more questions here. Vinny Tolman is the author of The Light After Death, My Journey to Heaven and Back. We will put a link to that below in the description of this interview. For someone that wants to get in touch with the Creator, that wants to be more spiritual, that wants to get more in tune with this type of thing without literally dying, do you have any tips for them, advice on, on how to do that? I do. So um, imagine the creator is a fast food restaurant. Go up and order something and then go forward and wait for the thing to arrive. Now, but here's what's weird is with the working with the creator, when we ask for stuff, we have to accept what arrives, whether it meets our perception or our expectation or not. Because many times we'll, let's say we're at a fast food restaurant, we order a burger but what we really need is a salad. So that's what we get. We get the salad. So um, we'll, we'll go up and say, hey, I need a burger, and God gives us a salad. So it's important for us. The way that we order, the way that we talk with the Creator is there's two ways. Um, some religions call it prayer. Other modalities call it meditation. But both are the same. Both are connecting to the inner divine. And that's what you need to do. Um, if you either both of them, though, I highly recommend... Um, learning how to master your breath. Bre breathing is, is part of our energy center of who we are as physical human beings here. And if you do some just very, very distinct um, breathing for just a few moments, like 90 seconds or even a couple of minutes before you pray, before you meditate, you can completely change your experience there. Just with some cool, calming breaths and very, very... Um, distinctly breathing in and out, in and out, and be very discerning on that, um, you'll be able to perceive when the Creator shows up. And that's, that's, that's where you begin. And then from there, um, I am, I'm, I'm working on a book too, which is a workbook, which helps people better connect to the inner divinity. But if you can start with breathing, start praying or meditating, whatever your modality is, um, reach out to God. God wants to reach out to you. The Creator wants to reach out to you and is constantly reaching to you. It's just a matter of us knocking on that door and employing our angels because there's a lot of unemployed angels out there. They want to do work for us, but we've got to ask. We have to ask. So we have, you mentioned a guide that you saw when you were on the other side, but you, 
you're you're saying that you can ask for help from from angels and from gu- other other guides and absolutely and- absolutely and and a lot of people they're like i don't pray to angels i don't do this to angels and and it's, i'm like i'm not telling you to pray to angels talk to them they they work in in the creator's stead they work for you for the creator so they're there as facilitators of this existence um, one of the greatest lies is, is that they don't exist. They do exist. I've seen them. I've, I've experienced them. I talk to them regularly and they're very, very much a part of our existence here. They're, they're such a high frequency being themselves that they don't typically manifest in the physical form, but you can get symbols and signs from them in their own ways. And, um, they are unequivocally, uh, built out of the, the creator's love for us. As beings, they are built out of the Creator's love for us, and that's how they facilitate their work in taking care of us and, and helping us where we need help. Um, but so many times, we ask for the help, and the help shows up, and we turn it away because it's not the help we expected. And um, we need to not do that. We need to be a, be very open to the perception of the Creator and the intuition of the Creator, which is all within so that when the help shows up, we know not to reject it, to receive it, and to lovingly receive it, no matter its form, even if it doesn't meet our criteria or our expectation. It's very important for us to accept the love of God so that we can um, move forward and, and in our own ways progress. Yeah. Hmm. And, and do you have any anecdotal experiences that since, since you've come back that you've experienced that, that are you know, more in tune with the creator that you have received messages and and can you share one of those? Yeah, I'll share. I share one. I've shared this one a couple of times, so I have no problem sharing this one. I, I, I keep my experiences very, um, very sacred to myself. So I don't share a lot of them, but this is one I share a bit. Um, so I went to a, a, a sandwich place one day, I ordered one sandwich, they handed me two and I, I, I got into a little bit of an argument with the, the, the guy and said, no, I only ordered one. He's like, no, you ordered two. Look at your receipt. I look at my receipt. And I'm like, oh, I did order two, but I only thought I ordered one just for me. And right away, I got the intuition from God in my heart that that sandwich was meant for someone else. So I said, okay, I, this must be meant for someone else then. And so I go out to my, my work vehicle. I own a business at the time, and we had a few work vehicles. And... Um, and I got this very strong kind of planting or download into my heart. I need you to drive over to this downtown part of, of the city. And at the time, I was living in, in Sparks, Nevada, which is over near Reno. And I, I could see in my own mind's eye this space downtown that, that, that I felt was being prompted to go down there. And I knew it was illegal to park there, too. And... And even though it was illegal to park there, they told me to park there. They said, don't worry. It's under construction. Just park there. So I'm like, okay, I trust you guys. I went down there. And and even if I had gotten a ticket, I would have accepted it as part of the blessing. But I went down there. We I parked there. Um, and, and right away, they said, get out of the vehicle. We need you to reach behind the seat. And one thing you never do is when it's not your work truck, you don't just reach behind that seat. It's a shared work truck. There might be all sorts mm-hmm. of tragedies back there, like old lunches and whatever. But I, but they're like, nope, reach behind the seat. I reach behind the seat, and I feel something very soft and, and nice. I pull it out, and it's a, a, a very nice hat and gloves. And this is in the middle of winter. And so now I have a sandwich, I have a hat, and I have gloves. And they say, we need you to walk down this straight street. And I'm like, okay. I start walking down this straight street. <laughs> And it comes around this this big building with this kind of blind wall. And they said, we need you to go around and turn left at that wall. I'm like, I'm like okay, <laughs> again, whatever. And they're not letting me know what's going on. I know this stuff is meant for someone else. I come around that blind corner, and I see another blind corner at the end of that block. And they say, we need you to go just to the end of that block. So I figured someone was going to meet me there. I needed to give them a sandwich and a hat and gloves. I thought it was going to be a friend or because I've I've experienced so many divine synchronicities this way that is absolutely beautiful. I got down to the end of the block and as I turned around the corner, there's this homeless guy literally screaming at the sky. God, why do you hate me so effing much? 
Ooh. And as he said that, as that escaped his lips, I walked up to him and I go, God doesn't hate you. He brought you a sandwich. He brought you a warm hat and some warm gloves. I handed it to him and I walked away. Didn't say anything else, just walked away. And it was a beautiful experience to me. And I've been on the receiving end of these miracles before. I've been on the receiving end where I needed some emotional help, some physical help, whatever. And someone just shows up random and they're my angel of the day. And that's the beauty is when we really align ourselves with the creator and and let the creator anchor within us and be a part of who we are. We get that constant guidance. We just know things. We just hear things. We just we just sense things. And it's not the same same thing every time. It's it's very different. It's just like our experience here is very different every day. But it's very beautiful to have that aspect of existence that we are all cared for. That here I was. I was like when this all first started with the second sandwich, I was probably eight miles away from this homeless guy. And who knows where he was at that exact moment. But but the creator took me from over there, parked me at the exact spot where I was I was kind of probably the, the, the shortest walk where I, it was safest and, and, and I was okay to park there. I didn't get a ticket um, and, and walked me right to him. And I was able to get back in my van before he could even get around the block to see where I went. And, and to me, I would love that he would think that there was an angel that helped him because I've, I've really, really felt angels in my life in, in, in the humans that helped me but also in the angels that help me. And there's a lot of that out there for us, you know, and it's important for us to do these things for each other and, and be aware of this divine intuition. It's getting stronger and stronger for everyone. But the enemy to our intuition is, is these right here. The phones. Our cell phones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the cell phones, they turn off your intuition. They, we, we, we think that the only thing we need to do is what our GPS tells us or what our boss tells us or what our, our friends or spouses, whatever, like we feel that's what all the direction in life is. But the more we can, you know, step away from technology on a regular basis and honor what I call the hour of power, the 30 minutes when you first wake up and the 30 minutes before you go to bed, it's very, very important that you don't use technology in the, in this space, because this is the space where God talks to you the most. This is the space where you're going to get some of your best big world direction on what you should do with your life and if you honor that hour of power that 30 minutes before bed 30 minutes after waking up put very um, high energy love energy things in that space you will change your life that alone will change your life profoundly yeah that's that's very fascinating do you believe in in a we are running really short on time here but do you believe in that in in a sense some people you know, strongly believe in manifestation and if they direct their energy towards something, you know, through prayer and visualization, that that... Yes. So it's really amazing. So love is like a flashlight. And if you can direct your love and keep it pointed on something long enough, that thing comes to you. And, and, and here's what's really weird. We can use it for bad and we can use it for good. That's one of the laws of the universe, of uh, laws of, the, of here, that as the, as the, and even quantum physics has proven it now, as the thought is created, then the universe starts changing and moving. In the, at the atomic level, things start changing in accordance to our desires. The key is to hold that loving desire the longest, because adding love to that desire, um, like a true light love is what I call it, if you can keep the light love on that desire, you bring it even faster because it's like, it's kind of like giving an acceleration to that whole system. And absolutely that that law of attraction is is a very tiny tip of an iceberg, but it is real. And it's important as you you embody that you can you can get lower on the iceberg and start realizing there's a lot more there. And it's the love frequency that you get to choose to amplify this process so that you can bring things even faster into your life. Instead of taking five years, take five months. You know, um, if you can amplify it with the love factor, yeah. Vinny Tolman is the author of The Light After Death, My Journey to Heaven and Back. We will put a link to the book in the description of this video. But Vinny, we are running kind of short on time. I, I have questions I, I would love to speak with you for hours, but we are running kind of short on time. Is there anything that 
well, first of all, where where can people find your book other than the description? In addition to the description, where can people find your book? Where can they find you? So I'm on I'm on Amazon, Audible, and Kindle, all three. And then um, I do have a website called Living God's Light, and they can find me there. They can follow me there. Um, I I'll post this interview there. Um, so at Living God's Light is a, a perfect website. It kind of captures it all. They can um, they can also hit a link to go over to Amazon and, and purchase the book on Audible or Kindle and and um, uh, or a physical physical book too. Yeah. And we we will also link to to Amazon and and your website below as well. Is there anything else that you wanted to say today that I just don't know enough to ask, or that you just wanted to say today? Yeah, absolutely. I love framing uh, my interview in, in, in God's love for us, the Creator's love for us, that the Creator loves us exactly how we are, exactly how we are, not for who, who the Creator wants us to be, because the, the Creator wants us to be who we are, who we are now, who we're going to be tomorrow, and who we were yesterday. No matter what those decisions are that, that we make to make us who we are, um, the Creator loves us exactly for who we are. And and there is no mistakes um, in us, outside of us. If we fully understand in this system of life, there is no mistakes that um, we can embody that love. We can learn about that love and start loving ourselves. But don't ever think that you can love anything in this life until you can love yourself. Because until you can love yourself first, you can't love anything in this life. You can't. It's impossible. It's like... Uh, uh, being thirsty and always looking to to buy motor oil to drink. You're never going to satisfy that thirst. You have to satisfy your own thirst with the, the living waters within first. And then you can find find happiness uh, outside yourself. Um, and that's actually where happiness lies, is inside and only inside, um, no matter where we are. But yeah, I, I like to let everyone know that that you are loved exactly how you are and how you're sitting and listening and watching this right now. That's how the Creator loves you. And, and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, you're extremely valuable to the Creator and to the universe, exactly how you are. Well, that's a really, really beautiful and inspiring message. Vinny Tolman, I really appreciate your time today, the author of The Light After Death, My Journey to Heaven and Back. Vinny, it's such a pleasure and honor to uh, meet and interview you today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Timothy. I really appreciate uh, all you're doing, and uh, love your channel, love love your following, and and uh, and Godspeed to your work. I I love how you're bringing that that high vibe, high frequency to to what you're doing. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much, Vinny. I really appreciate it. All right, so, have a blessed day. You as well. So that was my interview with Vinny Todd Tolman. If you like this interview, go ahead and hit the like button. Let me know in the comments, what did you think of this interview? I love checking out your comments. There are new videos coming soon on this channel. Go ahead and subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when they come out. As always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support.